this is quite a group here. Um, I'm going to try to make this short so, um, so that we can open up the questions to the audience. But I would like to just start by congratulating not only all of the speakers today um, for all of their really smooth and interesting uh, presentations, but also to the conference organizers. This was amazing. Um, I understand that they've spent three years organizing this conference, but it really shows. The flow today was, was managed perfectly, starting with the challenges of conserving software-based art, moving on to the art history and curatorial challenges, moving on to the history of technology with software-based art, and then we heard a model for risk assessment, several case studies of assessing risk at acquisition and then assessing risk for work that had already been in the collection for a while, and then more proactive work of conservators to create backups and to um, uh, make, to do emulation, virtualization, um, and then ending with this remarkable, really interesting um, presentation from Rhizome, which made me think about the work that goes on outside of the museum world. So my mind is buzzing, and I, and I hope your minds are buzzing as well with um, questions. Um, I can imagine questions having to do with practice and questions having to do with technology. That's what Tech Focus is all about, practice and technology. And I think there's probably going to be a lot of questions about the specifics of technology. I may be wrong uh, with virtualization, emulation, and, and so on. So I thought I would just start by throwing out a question that anybody might want to answer about practice. Um, I had a few surprises today. One was learning about the SFMOMA model of sharing documentation and authority with an artist um, through um, the use of a Git and you know where where the um, any changes can are, are recorded, but changes can can happen. Um, so to me, this this um, is a whole new model for for museums, and I and I think quite a wonderful and exciting one. And Another surprise was the thought that too much technical metadata is a bad thing. <laughs> Coming from where I come from, you can't have enough technical metadata. So, um, but maybe I'd just like to ask, um, either for the artists, have you learned anything from working with conservators that might affect your practice? We touched on this a little bit about new forms of documentation and the responsibility for artists to document. Or for conservators or others working in museums, have you learned anything from artists? Um, have you been forced to open up a little bit and realize preservation of the orig original object is not an option, So, but we want to retain our professional ethics of minimal intervention? Um, so does anyone want to answer? Don't all talk at once. Yes. Should be on. Okay. I think it's always a two-way street from the uh, start because at the moment you collect a work, you do the interviewing uh, process and talk about future options. So I think from that moment on, you start learning from artists, or at least I have. I'm not a conservator, but I have been participating in the um, interviews related to new media. So it's constantly um, a back and forth, in my opinion, and a process of opening up. I've changed my mind uh, many times. And one thing I wanted to point out, as you're saying, it's all technical and so technically focused. I think it's surprising how fast you run into philosophical issues from the start. And um, when we were working with uh, Ben Fino Radden on Douglas Davis World's longest collaborative sentence, the big questions were really philosophical ones. And that was uh, the challenge. Much more, and I'm not saying that there weren't technological challenges, um, but they had to adhere to what, how we wanted the piece to be perceived. I think Dragan got to that, or with your last question, uh, Joanna, about, well, we're experiencing in one environment, what about the 10 others, and what's the obligation here? So we get back to identifying artwork integrity and 
developing solutions for retaining that in integrity and, and asking in the end what, what is the artwork. I, I think I want to say a little bit more about because this question came up with like control and um, you know giving the giving the artist permission sharing something um, just to throw that out there what is the alternative like is the alternative that we take the source code and we lock it down in its now state and we create this bubble and we actually we don't allow the work to evolve to anything that it may could become. So if that is the alternative, I think we're very happy to give up control and you know watching the, the work evolve to what it might want to become. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, I I think that the uh, the the potentials that are uh, inherent in, in software-based artworks is the thing that should be conserved and not the not not a single state or a, uh, I think that is because that's a, that's a very easy approach also because um, that's just one thing that needs to be conserved in the end and you know I don't want to put words in SF MoMA's mouth but um, I think it's important to dispel this idea that using a collaboration tool like Git is somehow relinquishing authority. It's a collaboration tool. And, you know, it's something that, you know, like was alluded to, there's a whole version history that's maintained. If something changes you don't like, you can roll it back. It's not as though you're somehow giving the artist read-write access to your conservation records. <laughs> it's, it's a way of having a shared space in the middle where you can come to collaborate. And if you like that, you can keep it. It's really as simple as that. So it's not a question of, you know, giving everything over to the artist. Yeah, we haven't talked about a version control technically in depth, um, but it's a series of snapshots. And each snapshot has a, uh, a unique idea of a checksum. And then, you know, so each snapshot can keep growing. You can also branch it. You can say acquisition version. And then you can branch it uh, to upgrade version. So that's a way of tracking things. Um, you can also, since it is a series of snapshots, you can use, a re you can revert. So I revert to this snapshot, how the code was at this point in time. Maybe I don't want to change it anymore. Maybe I don't want to migrate it. I can then emulate it, for example. So it just, it's, it gives you some flexibility. And I, I've been looking, you know, some works acquired in the 90s and stuff like that. And I'll just have a binary thing. And the only option I have is to emulate it. Um, in some cases. So this gives you uh, more choices in, in uh, a future uh, where you don't know what the future will be like, as Dragon said. Yeah. Right. The other thing is that my experience of um, having to change the code in a work was uh, for a piece that accesses the internet, so it does need to be able to connect to uh, Google API. So if we wanted to show the work, we didn't have a, an option. And, but then I had no control of what the programmer was doing to the code, so I had no idea what he changed. We then had a, strong, a long discussion and he showed me what he'd done. I could have made the comparison as well. I mean, it's possible to compare the code we had to the code we had at the end, but this seems like a much better way of keeping track of what's going on than being, you know, sifting through someone else's code and trying to find what was changed. Um, to once more get back to the, oops, the feedback? No. Um, to get back to the discussion of how much of an artwork may change and how much change we permit as a museum or, or collection, um, I think it all comes down to the point that there are different uh, stakeholders, different interests, and different perspectives um, on significance. So, for example, you know, while the artist um, might be most interested in seeing the piece evolve or, uh, um, you know, being um, state of the art technology wise or being exhibited or, um, um, you know, praised for innovation or whatever, I'm just making this up. Um, there, there are other um, stakeholders like um, art historians, curators, etc. Um, who also want to contextualize the work in art history and, and um, 
as we learned from Mark today, um, the history of technology. So, you know, this piece was generated at that time with these tools, and those tools at the time were really innovative. And maybe we need some education around that to make the work that looks very old and outdated now um, 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 visible as something that used to be innovative at the time. Mark Heller showed this really cool um, net artwork today, the blue screen, where you have to scroll, scroll, scroll. Seems really boring today, but at the time, interactivity was not a concept online. So the scroll bar bars were the only thing that he could do to manipulate. That's significance from, from our point of view, and maybe the artist does not share that perspective. And there's not only individual stakeholders as with people, but there's also the agency of the institution. I'm thinking about the difference between rhizome.org and the Guggenheim, for instance. Um, these two different institutions are going, probably going to make very different decisions, uh, or at least some different decisions about managing change in the artworks. Um, so I'd like to just put that in there as well. Um, let's open it up for, um, Questions from the audience. J.P. Brown, the Field Museum. So, um, thinking about this question of change and how things change because they do, what does the panel feel that would constitute virtuous patina in a computer-based artwork? I think that's the marginalia the, of you know, the old operating system and the old interface. It's the things that, um, there's a piece in Rhizome's collection that consists of tons and tons and tons and tons of iframes and scroll bars. And if you look at it in contemporary Safari, you don't see any of them, obviously. So I think in terms of patina, it's, um, it's those parts. You know, there is affect that we have as, we're all computer users, let's face it, so we have effective responses to seeing OS 9, for instance, at least if you were alive at the time. So I think that th that's one form of patina. Um, I would like to say something about this because <clears throat> the way we see OS 9 now is not the way you used to see OS 9 when it was on those computers. It was something that's often forgotten, like pixel on an LCD screen looks very different as a, than a pixel on the actual CRT tube screen. And so it's, we're not looking at the same thing. And patina was actually removed through emulation, I guess, right? But is that something that should be emulated as well? Or <laughs> how are we dealing with this? Do we have to buy CRT screens? To keep uh, alive? Yeah, this, I, I hadn't time to show that, but you can put this emulator on a USB drive and boot from it, and then it will just boot this one thing, and you can connect that computer to a CRT screen, for example. There is also software CRT emulation uh, for some uh, pieces that might look better when they are blurry, actually. But um, yeah, these are, uh, this is, this is, um, yeah, this is also a, a level of detail that uh, sometimes cannot be tackled. Uh, because, for example, if uh, for a really good CRT emulation, then w I would also need a really high resolution, which means much bigger uh, bandwidth for the graphics. and then you kind of need to balance, do I want that the mouse pointer moves with 30 frames per second or five frames per second? And then usually the, the movement is, is more important. I'd like to play perhaps the devil's advocate here. Um, that really relates also to, okay, more uh, philosophical question indeed is, do we still talk about change? Is that still relevant? The amount of change that we do to work, because obviously these works will change. No matter how hard we try, it will change. So is it still relevant to talk about change or should we actually focus our attention differently? I don't know the answer yet, but. <laughs> one, one of the um, tenets in conservation has always been to, well, manage change. I think most conservators admit that's what they do in all realms of conservation, but to document like crazy, and I'd say we're getting pretty good at that, but also documenting the justification for the decisions that we make. And I would say that's very important for software-based art so that people in the future not only know what we did, but why we did it. And also to the point of uh, change things, 
come and go basically. So patina for me is also related to navigation paradigms. It's related to a certain kind of vernacular. In the CD-ROM age, the main navigation uh, paradigm was drag and drop. Yeah. Then we switched to clicking. Now we see drag and drop again. Or I'm looking at um, a younger post-internet um, artist, I hate that term, but <laughs> for lack of a better one, like uh, Petra Courtright's homepage with all those you know, animated GIFs. And it's a retro aesthetic that um, people like Wolfgang Stähle played with more than a decade before. It looks exactly the same, but it was contextualized by a different kind of internet or web. And of course, uh, Dragan and all you have played a lot with that kind of vernacular, so that's also part of it. And things will recur again in a different context, be seen in a very different context. So they can't even be um, associated with a decade, but rather with a certain vernacular and of use. More questions? I have a feeling this panel can just continue without you, but uh, <laughs> if there are any questions from the audience, please come up to the mic. I was just gonna say that um, I know, I'm not, I know, I'm sorry, come, 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 really, I mean, it's okay, but while you're coming, I'll talk. <laughs> so, so um, I was, uh, a guy told me that he, um, he downloaded the Puppet Motel, uh, the, the disc image, and opened it, and, well, he was hanging out there earlier in the day, and um, I, you know, so it's sort of interesting to be saying, you know, can't do much with this, and then have to have him download it and, and immediately be able to see it. There's something really interesting about that, you know, that we can do all this analysis, right, and we can come to some conclusions within a certain framework, but then, you know, next, in the next row, someone is watching it. So I'm, I'm really intrigued by what you were talking about, uh, Dragon, and imagining like all of these different versions, uh, or different, different browsers running the same work simultaneously in some space, or more spaces than one. Anyway. We have a question here. Could you speak closer presenter. to the mic? Ah, yes, um, to the last presenter. Because um, you've been mentioning <clears throat> this word, which I found very interesting. You have been speaking about minimalism of technical data. And I'd like, <clears throat> maybe between the time of the presentation, it was um, uh, that much uh, gone in deep, in depth. So I'd like to, to ask if you can speculate a bit more and like tell specifically how, what you can, how, how it's possible to choose meaningful metadata. I mean, how, um, what, what are the parameters uh, in that sense? Okay, um, it, is, it is important to know that this is an ongoing effort and an ongoing research, but uh, I found it very productive to think only about metadata that is actually helping me to recall a computational performance and anything else I'm not really interested in. And I'm also trying to reference an actual running system, an actual software that is existing and running and performing. And I don't want to reference a description about how this system works. And um, this, is, this is possible if you use emulation the way uh, the, um, the emulation as a service framework suggests it. Uh, and yeah, it's because the, for the, the depth of, of description, even for uh, operating system like Windows 3.11 or so, which we now laugh about because it's so primitive, but um, it is incredibly complex and the vendor didn't understand it and as, a conservator, as conservators we should also not put too much time into understanding it when nobody understood it before. Uh, that's that's that uh, sounds really crazy to me, because and um, it is always about what works. This is also what what users do and what artists do. They will not read the standard and the best practice and what what will, what I need to follow that this and that thing 
is actually working, but they do what works. And I like, I like this idea. Of course, it needs to become a best practice to do that. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, nobody reads the instructions and artists also not because, I mean, especially when they're artists. I have a question and a favor or concern. I don't know how to frame it. The first question is if we already understand that uh, this type of art is going to be changing all the time, when should I stop the change? in order to the piece, to still be the piece of the same work. It's changing all the time that I don't know if I'm going to recognize the piece in seven years. It is, it's going to be so different that I don't know if it is the same work that I, I'm looking in these seven years. And the other concern, the concern or favor that I have is all this uh, research is focused on works that you are acquiring or you are, they belong to an institution. And I come from a place that institutions are not buying software art. And I'm concerned that all my historical software art is not, we don't have recollection or memories about that um, development. And I would like to ask you if you could share your tools with not even with the institution, but with artists or persons that are trying to preserve something that is not being preserved by institutions. That's it. Yeah, just, just quickly, um, I think there is definitely more and more of a motion towards um, open source tools, not necessarily developed by institutions, but I think it would be important also um, that institutions get on board with networks that develop open source tools for everyone because as you say, the less we collect that work, the less uh, kind of bodies take on caring for them, the more um, they will vanish. As to your first question, I think first of all, there's never the silver bullet approach to any type of work. We make decisions on a case by case basis as the case studies today have shown. I don't think that works necessarily will not be recognizable anymore. Actually, I don't think that should be the case if conservation is successful. There may be works that migrate through so many platforms or get emulated and they look absolutely the same. And then there are works that are technology agnostic where the artists are saying, I don't care what technology you're uh, using, the concept needs to be maintained. There was one work, for example, we did at the Whitney that sat on the audio tour, um, audio tour players, and the artists were saying technology is irrelevant to this project. If 20 years from now all of our object labels are holographic, then and museum tours are holographic, then we want the piece to be recreated for a holographic platform. What is important here is the idea, not the technology, and I think that varies radically across the spectrum. Um, I think that if you have uh, the works are on removable media, is that what are they mostly on removable media? They're like optical disks or zip drives or things like that, or are you talking about mostly things that are, you know, made, have been made recently? Yeah, so. Well, if they were made since the 90s, then they're probably on optical disk or they're on zip drives or they're on different kinds of removable media, but perhaps some older uh, hard drives. And, and some network art was sold, then I'll pass it to him. But the, <laughs> the uh, but I mean, I think disk imaging, disk imaging is really fundamentally, we used to do that when we used to get disks. In the old days, we'd get a disk and you'd make a backup because you needed to have it because you wouldn't be able to get the, the, the disk again. Now, you know, you can download software and then you can download it again if you pay for it. But it, disk imaging was always part of the operating system for computers and so it's not that big a deal and it doesn't cost that much to get it set up. And so I would say getting, getting those imaged and into some kind of space, you know, would be a good idea. And they're not huge usually either. They're not really big 
big um, file, they don't take up a lot of room because they, CDs couldn't handle that much. What were they, 4.5? I can't remember, but something. They weren't very big. And so I would say getting them off of the removable media and onto some other, you know, onto a hard drive and then replicate that or different ways of backing up, that's a great thing to do. And then, um, you know, uh, there's a, I mean, basically taking care of digital material, digital data, doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't really matter what it is, it's just a matter of having the principles, of having a backup, you know, having the backups in different places, so if, you know, if something happens at your house, <laughs> then it, it, it's backed up somewhere else geographically separate. So there's like principles, and actually I think that Helen will be talking about some of those tomorrow that would apply to this kind of situation. But I hear you because there's a lot of work that's out there that's not collected. And we have to we have to work together to get it to, to you know, a stable place. And I don't know if this is all relevant for what you're talking about, Joe, but um, a good home for orphaned works and media that isn't really going to be feasibly collected by a memory institution or be stewarded in the way that it needs to be. You know, making a disk image is useless if you're just going to put it on a hard drive and put that hard drive on a shelf. Um, so in any case, a good home for such things is the Internet Archive. Uh, when we did the transfer station project at the new museum, we knew that capturing an old umatic tape and handing a hard drive to the artist was a very bad idea because they would likely just take that hard drive and put it in a shoebox, and that's just as bad as umatic tape. So we uploaded everything to the Internet Archive. If they opted in to our services, they had to be okay with releasing their work to the public domain. And there were many artists and gallerists actually that were okay with that. Uh, Wolfgang Stela actually is one example. Hey, we have another question. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, I'm Crystal from the Smithsonian. And I was really struck, I think, by Martina's comment uh, or question earlier to the group um, about should we collect this? Can we acquire this? Um, and I wonder if considering the complex nature of these works and, and their ever-changing um, parameters um, that the answer for a collecting institution is ever no. <coughs> like, there's so many great successful stories here, I think, today, really great presentations, but I wonder if there's ever a point where the risk assessment is so high that you don't, you decide not to. So I think the biggest risk is really losing culture and losing our cultural context and losing our history. And that is the biggest danger. And in the light of that, I would always say it's worth it to taking the risk with the artwork. You know, I imagine a history where all of the art we're talk we talked about today would drop out. It wouldn't be there. That experimentation would miss from uh, would be missing from the history of art, I think that would be absolutely horrible, or to me that would be a, a horror scenario. And if we look at museum collections, I mean, they have been taking so many risks with analog works you know, that are highly unstable, that are really, really difficult, and making major commitments to them and invest millions into conserving them. And why wouldn't we do the same for this type of art? So. And just to follow up on that, I mean, um, Museums collect works where they get nothing. So thinking about a Tino Segal work, you have nothing. You have a, a verbal contract. So that is very high risk, and museums will collect that. So this seems like if you can work through those processes, you know, there's, there's a way to deal with it and keep it going. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think what we are coming to now is that there is also a perceived risk that is much higher than the actual risk in many cases. Uh, also on a, on a technical level, when I notice that museums, for example, start collecting apps before they are collecting a website because the app just looks more self-contained because it's on a phone and you can hold it in your hand. Um, that's, uh, that's a huge challenge to conserve an app because the app just pretends that computing is actually happening on your device. Uh, it's, uh, so, yeah, there is also just misconceptions sometimes. Claudia Rock from the Tate. Um, I would like to address you, um, three young ladies. Uh, yeah. 
who um, documented and interpreted the um, Sibrin's code. And um, this code was written in lingo, right? And um, it must have been like a foreign language for you. And I wonder how you could understand it or what helped you to understand it and how difficult it was. So there's actually documentation available on the internet for Lingo. And Lingo, like Nia said, is a very verbose language. So it's actually not very difficult. Like, I don't know if you know, but C is definitely a lot more difficult to understand than Lingo. And I guess programmers are always, you know, asked to learn new languages on the go. And you kind of build that skill to kind of adjust into it. And then it kind of comes, it basically has the same skeleton. Anyway, same sort of structure. You declare variables, you use them, you make it do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I would say coming from the perspective of um, me and Mia, who aren't computer science majors, but in the minor, I think we're kind of lucky to have that perspective of being a little bit of outsiders anyway. So when we're approaching a language that we're not familiar with, we're trying to make it accessible to people that aren't programmers anyway. So I think with us looking at Lingo, it was almost beneficial to have no experience with it and sort of start from scratch and try to glean something that would be useful to conservators who aren't programmers. But I think I wanna add um, one thing is, um, I thought that it was very foreign of a concept that you would have a stage and you have these member things that are on the stage and you control these me each of these members, which isn't really that straight up forward of a concept for me as a programmer. So that was one different thing that I had to actually look up and read through like the lingo um, documentation in order for me to like understand the, the whole nature of the language. Hi, the Neil Simmer from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We're seeing things like the Internet Archive and uh, the rate that museums are collecting software-based works is relatively slow. Do we think we can get into a cycle where after we are finished with our documentation, we publish back to Internet Archive so that the public extension of the work's life and viability doesn't stop at our walls or at our institutions, but it goes back to the Internet? Well, um, Glenn spearheaded an uh, initiative with Inca for sharing conservation documentation. And, um, you know, Git has actually been on the minds of a lot of us on this stage recently. We've been thinking about ways that we can use it to share information among institutions um, in, as far as conservation documentation. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think when you talk about unleashing conservation documentation to the public, that really limits what you can talk about. Um, so I think it, it sounds good in principle, you know, information wants to be free, but when information is free, it has to be censored, unfortunately. I mean, we can't just talk about every aspect of the work publicly in ways that the artist wouldn't want to be shared or. Yeah, I mean, um um, you know, there are uh, obviously a lot of um, sensitivities with the material if you're talking about damages and insurance, etc. So potentially conservation treatment reports, etc. could be something that you don't necessarily, uh, or where you want to control who, um, who, yeah is on the receiving end of that information. And by the way, sharing conservation analysis and documentation is not a new idea at all. One of the first projects that Inca came up with in Europe was the artist, um, what was the name? Artist Archive. Artist Archive, where um, museums that hold contemporary art across Europe shared their uh, documentation um, in a meta database, which means that you didn't, you didn't upload um, um, you know, the actual documentation, but you created a set of um, Dublin Core metadata about um, about the, the kind of documentation, artist interview, a video, extensive um, material analysis data or so, and then you would um, give your contact information and people could browse the database. Oh, he worked on Hesse as well and um, I get in touch with her. So that, that's been going on since 1999 or something. 1999. 
I know I'm supposed to be a neutral actor up here as a moderator, but this is something I feel really strongly about. So I just want to say, um, I think it's really important that museums share their documentation, just as museums should share their evolving practices with other people um, that don't have the resources that some museums do. Um, I just wrote an article about sharing this kind of documentation, arguing that for works that are iterative, that change every time they're installed, museum staff have the sort of privilege of having this documentation, knowing how a work has been in the past and how it can be in the future. And I think that they owe it to their publics to share this information, because uh, I think a lot of people would be interested. So in the article, I tried to explore what kind of information should be shared within the museum, because as we all know, registrars have their files, conservators have their files, curators have their files, and they don't necessarily know what's in each other's files. But I think we need to share among professionals, as we're doing today, uh, but I think we also need to share with the public. And, and there are various concerns with this. We need to think very carefully about what kind of documentation we have and what do the artists think about us sharing it. Um, so we need to get permission to share. Uh, but we also need to be thinking professionally about controlled vocabularies, um, about maybe open source database software that we can be using uh, cross-institutionally. We can think about linked data um, that is going on in, in other industries. So I think there's a lot that we can do to move forward in um, sharing our documentation. Sorry, that was a little lecture, but I had to give it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think that, um, well, I was just saying, I think it was to Glenn about how I just recently, in preparing for this uh, today, read an interview with a programmer that I think would be really useful for a lot of people to uh, to listen to. And it would be great for, it's associated with certain artwork, but it would be great for it to be shared. Because it has so much information about the program that is very wide, a program is very widely used. But in another way, um, I mean, uh, when technology is replaced within a certain artwork, you often lose a lot about technology history, a lot about the way artists made work, about, about what their thinking was, you know, and I've seen that happen. Um, in particular, and I wish I could think of the work, and I'm, I'm sorry that I, Helpless Robot, who is the artist in uh, Canada. Norman but, White. pardon me? Norman White. Norman White. Thank you. And um, when that was, when the, when the technology was changed within this, uh, I think it was a 386, was, and there, was, there were two different um, processes happening, and they were replaced with newer computers. But the way that he used to um, troubleshoot his work was through, he had, a, he had set up, he had to attach a monitor, and he had a whole way of doing diagnostics. And that, and that way that he was doing diagnostics spoke a great deal to the way that that work was made. It's, and, and then in losing, and, and, the, and the fact that it was conserved, which was wonderful, but there was a whole story there that I think should, should be moved to an archive, personally. But I know it's nobody's job to do that. So, so it's not, I'm not saying that it's, any, that it, you know, somebody, there's anything wrong with what's going on now, but I think that if there was a way to establish some point at which that information is no longer useful or, you know, it's useful for other people. So, anyway. You know whose job it is as museum educators? And I think, you know, we, um, we who work within museums could do a lot better job at working with people with educational skills and with the skills and, and um, you know, the, whose job it is to outreach and, and share knowledge with the public. How are we doing on time? I'm, I'm waiting for Joanna to tell us when oh, to stop. Or, oh, am I the moderator? <laughs> We're, oh, that's my job? Okay, I think we need to call it a day. It's been a really long day and a really fabulous day. So we are all to meet. Breakfast is at 8.30 and we start again at 9.30. And everybody needs to remember to load their software on their laptops and come prepared tomorrow. Right, have a good evening and we'll see you in the morning.